Let's go ahead and get underway uh, to ensure our panelists have plenty of time to deliver our papers. This is session 5E, uh, British Naval Policy and Planning in the Pacific and Atlantic Theaters, 1911-1941. Uh, I'm John Beeler from the University of Alabama. Uh, we have decided uh, we are going to go in uh, chronological order. So the order of the paper, last two papers you see uh, on the uh, on the program are going to be reversed. I'm going to introduce each of our panelists in turn prior to their papers, uh, rather than doing all three of them once at once at the beginning of our session, uh, which means that it is my honor to introduce uh, Professor John C. Mitchum, uh, Chair of the Department of History at Duquesne University. Uh, his first book, Race and Imperial Defense in the British World, 1870-1914, was published by Cambridge in 2016 is, uh, and was a uh, finalist for the Templar Medal. He's working on his second book right now, which is being impeded slightly by his administrative duties. <laughs> uh, he, in fact, he told me that the, the Expected publication date was 2045. Uh, it is the right now in the title, the working title is The Empire Club Imperial Politics, White Supremacy, and the Making of the Commonwealth. It is under contract by, with Oxford University Press. Uh, he's the general editor of the journal Britain in the World and is a fellow of the Royal Historical Society. Morning. Good morning. It's nice to be back here. I was telling John the other day, this was my uh, very first conference presentation at McMullen uh, in 2007. So I think I've attended all but one since then, each time a little fatter and grayer, but, <laughs> but uh, enjoying it nonetheless. So it's nice to be back. My paper today explores the intersection of British naval strategy and Anglo-Dominion relations from, uh, I, I think the title says 1911 to 1922, but upon realizing that there are a fair number of Washington, very good Washington conference papers, I have decided to focus a little bit more on this earlier period of 1909 to roughly 1917 or so. But in particular, uh, I'm interested in the role that New Zealand played in shaping imperial defense policy. Admittedly, New Zealand uh, might be Bit of an odd place for thinking about colonial influences on British naval policy. The, the Dominion had a tiny population in 1914 of only about 1 million white settlers. Uh, and at almost 12,000 miles from Buckingham Palace, is literally on the other side of the world from the epicenter of great power politics. And moreover, New Zealanders reveled in, the, in their sort of self proclaimed identity as the most loyal and imperially minded Dominion, and thus were less inclined than, say, Australia or Canada or even South Africa. Challenge, to challenge British control over defense policy. Nonetheless, New Zealand played an outsized role in the many political discussions about the future of British naval policy east of Suez. So today I'd like to make maybe two points. Uh, the first is rather more conventional, that naval historians, we, we, we often think about our subject from the perspective of naval professionals uh, and from the idea of strategic orthodoxy. But that New Zealand's naval ambitions must be understood equally in the context of both imperial politics and budding colonial nationalism. Admiralty officials lectured Dominion leaders until they were blue in the face about the need for unity of command and a strong concentration of naval resources, chiefly capital ships, of course, in European waters. But these professionals often failed to grasp the Admiralty was dealing with democracies with proud national instincts and specific geostrategic concerns. As Chris Bell has explained in, uh, in a recent article, the origins of the Dominion, Dominion Navy must be understood as prioritizing what he calls, quote, sentiment over strategy. The second claim is a little bit more unconventional, and that is that New Zealand's naval ambitions were not purely about contributing to Britain's global naval hegemony, but about advancing an auspicious empire building project of its own. Many white New Zealanders saw their dominion as occupying an important place in a broader Anglo-Saxon world order. They imagined a future for themselves, despite their small population, imagined a future for themselves as the center of a vast Pacific island imperium. And like their neighbors in Australia, they coveted the mineral-rich territories in Micronesia and engaged in a busy empire project of their own. Next slide. The origin of New Zealand's blue water ambitions can be traced back to the 1909 fleet units in France. As far back as the 1880s, New Zealand had begun paying annual subsidies towards the Royal Navy. But in 1909, New Zealand Premier Sir Joseph Ward, in the midst of the Anglo-German naval, Anglo naval arms race, 
offered to fund the construction of a capital ship for the Royal Navy. At subsequent Imperial Defense, at a subsequent Imperial Defense Conference, excuse me, the Admiralty agreed to maintain three self-contained quote, fleet units in the Far East based around a modern battle cruiser. One would be provided by Britain and based in the East Indies, while another would serve as the genesis of the independent Royal Australian Navy. New Zealand's contribution, the battle cruiser HMS New Zealand, would operate on the China Station, 5,000 miles from Auckland Harbor. For local defense, the Admiralty promised to dispatch modern light cruisers to patrol New Zealand waters, with the sort of caveat that if, if, uh, uh, if, if enemy vessels had, had gained anything close to, to supremacy in New Zealand waters, the game would be over anyway. The fleet unit concept met with widespread approval in New Zealand circles as it catered to both blue water and local defenses, as well as both to imperial and national interests alike. However, in October 1911, the new First Lord of the Admiralty, Sir Winston Churchill, modified the arrangement by withholding one of the battle cruisers from the Far East and suspending plans to dispatch modern ships to New Zealand, all without notifying the Dominion government. This breach of trust, and we'll kind of be talking today about the, the, the sort of aftermath of what happens in this wake, this breach of trust uh, uh, would cast a shadow over all future imperial relations, particularly as they relate to defense between Britain and the Dominion. In 1912, New Zealand experienced a change in government the forever altered trajectory of naval defense. The new prime minister was William Neff Massey, an Ulster-born conservative who agrarian populism earned him the nickname Farmer Bill. Though a fervent imperialist and indeed uh, somewhat sort of self-declared British-based patriot, Massey didn't hesitate to challenge Whitehall when it threatened New Zealand's national interests. He labored to guarantee that the Pacific would become, as he saw it, a vast Anglo-Saxon domain free from Asian influence or immigration. He worked with Canadian and Australian figures to forge more independent foreign and naval policies, even laying the foundation for an autonomous New Zealand Navy. Moreover, and this is, I think, that we, the, one of the things that, that New Zealand historians um, often are, are feel rather uncomfortable discussing as part of their own national historiography, but Massey and many of his uh, uh, colleagues in the cabinet pursued a dream of a New Zealand-dominated Pacific Empire with a gusto that would make supple roads flush with shame. Between 1912 and, and 1925, the, 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 the sort of uh, during his time in office, um, his administration sought to purchase, annex, or just outright seize territories that, and these are the ones that I found in various uh, collections that include um, the Cook Islands, the New Hebrides, Micronesia, Samoa. New Caledonia, Pitcairn Island, Tonga, Tahiti, Fiji, and even Hawaii and the Easter Islands. Some of these islands were desired for mineral rich resources, the mineral resources principally phosphate, while others could be potential naval bases against this imagined Japanese danger north of the equator. Massey's naval ambitions then were in large part an active effort to carve out a sphere of influence in the Far East for his settler colonial nation building project. Upon becoming premier in 1912, Massey rang the collision bell over what he perceived as the paltry state of British naval security in the Far East. He regularly complained to the governor, Lord Liverpool, that he received the most reliable news of European naval developments not from the colonial office, but from British and Australian newspapers. Increasingly, he and his trusted minister of defense and sort of prime assistant prime minister, Sir James Allen, determined that the best path forward would be to abandon the subsidy payments and follow Australia's lead in creating an independent navy. In 1913, Massey dispatched his Minister of Defense, Allen, to London for consultations at the, with the Admiralty. At a somewhat acrimonious meeting of the Committee of Imperial Defense, Churchill lectured Allen on the merits of sound naval strategy, reminding him, and he's, he's reading aloud from Mahan, and he's, he's, he's going through all of the you know sort of strategic orthodoxy, reminding him that the Dominion's geographical isolation a security blanket provided by the Anglo-Japanese Alliance rendered the dispatch of modern warships to New Zealand unnecessary. In response, Massey drafted a new naval bill in 1913 that laid the keel for an independent New Zealand Navy. Massey framed this new force not as a rejection of the Imperial Link, uh, not as a rejection of the Imperial Link, but rather a natural evolution of what he saw as this racial maritime partnership taking place in the Pacific. He said, quote, it will be held together by sentiment, 
by the ties of kinship, by the pride of race, and by the confidence of the people in the empire itself. That is what we are looking forward to, and that, I believe, is what 99 out of every 100 of the people in New Zealand are looking forward to. For its part, Churchill and the Admiralty held its nose and loaned the Dominion a third-class cruiser, the HMS Philomel, to train colonial ratings. First launched in 1890, the poor ship was very, barely seaworthy. In fact, it was actually sent for the scrapyard when they gave it to New Zealand. Uh, but nonetheless, Massey had taken a step in acquiring New Zealand's recognition on the global stage. At the heart of this debate, though, about, about collective security in the Far East was New Zealand's resistance to rely on Japanese naval power in the event of a war with, European, with, with a European power. Figures like Massey and Allen fully understood complexities of modern naval strategy, modern doctrine, and the need for a concentration of force in European waters. However, they also refused the mortgage security of this deeply unpopular alliance with Japan. Indeed, Massey and his colleagues viewed Japan as its chief rival. At Massey's instruction, Allen lobbied the Colony Office, <coughs> excuse me, and the Foreign Office for the Dominion's purchase um, or annexation of these various islands, um, uh, but framed these requests along strategic lines. They would, he argued, provide important imperial polling stations or naval bases that would benefit the entire empire and some of this correspondence also that could benefit any future Anglo-American business alliance as well. As he also got in a public spat with Churchill over the value of the Japanese alliance. On the eve of war, Churchill gave an interview in which he insisted, quote, if Britain's power were shattered, the only course then open to the whites in the Pacific would be to seek the protection of the United States. That may be so, Massey countered in another public address, but, if, but quote, but if he means that the people of Australia and New Zealand are be satisfied with the protection afforded by Japanese ships and Japanese sailors, then Mr. Winston Churchill is very much mistaken. These xenophobic concerns played out in the opening months of the Great War, and I'd like to briefly point to two episodes that helped to sour anglo dominion naval relations. The first occurred immediately after the British declaration of war. Within four days, the New Zealand government put together a small expeditionary force for operations in the South Pacific, and escorted by Australian, British, and French warships and accompanied by the lumbering HMS Philomel, the force captured German Samoa on August 29th without firing a shot. However, subsequent operations in the Pacific were forestalled by the Japanese entry into the war. Efforts by the Foreign Office to limit Japan's operations to China failed, and so the Japanese Navy thus swept across the Central Pacific, capturing, capturing Yap, the Marshall Islands, the Paulus Islands, the Marianas, and the Caroline Islands. These swift conquests caught the Pacific Dominions completely by surprise and denied them their long hoped for spoils of war, but it also brought Japan much closer to Australia and New Zealand. Quote, the intervention of Japan undoubtedly does raise some very difficult questions, acknowledged Wellington's Evening Post. Quote, what is now taking place in the North Pacific should surely indicate to the most optimistic that the remote future may not be so remote as it once seemed. The second episode was the dramatic cruise of Germany's East Asia Squadron under the command of Admiral Maximilian von Spee. The squadron's two armored cruisers were more than a match for any British warships in the Pacific, except of course the Australian battle cruiser, uh, HMAS Australia. And the outbreak of hostilities found Von Speed cruising in the Caroline Islands in the Central Pacific. Von Speed made, a, uh, made plans for a homeward dash around the South Pacific, or through the South Pacific and around Cape Horn, wreaking as much havoc as possible in the process. But for several tense weeks, the residents of coastal cities in New Zealand, particularly in the North Islands, worried about the sudden arrival and bombardment uh, by Von Speed's ships. Concern was magnified on September 14th when the squadron briefly appeared off Samoa, terrifying the New Zealand occupation force before disappearing into the mysterious expanses of the Pacific. So this fear, somewhat misplaced obviously, but this fear of the German squadron caused a serious clash between Prime Minister Massey and British authorities. By early September, over 4,000 volunteers of the New Zealand Expeditionary Force waited in Wellington, ready to join the Australians in a massive 42-ship convoy bound to Europe. However, Massey worried about such a vulnerable fleet proceeding across the Tasman Sea without adequate escort. The Admiralty insisted that the Germans would never venture as far as New Zealand and explained that waiting for sufficient escort would just result in a delay of six weeks. 
Massey acquiesced, and on September 24th, the first two transports departed New Zealand waters. But that evening, Lord Liverpool, the governor, received a panic telegram from the Governor General of Australia, forcing the immediate recall of the transports. Then, in the last week of September, came the news that Von Spee had struck again, shelling Tahiti and sinking French gunboats. The German cruisers ultimately dashed across the Pacific to Chile, where they annihilated the British squadron in early November before ultimately being their demise, the Battle of the Falkland Islands. Yet this outcome and course was unknown to Massey, who worried that they would double back and ambush the vulnerable Anzac convoy. On the evening of October 4th, Massey met with Lord Liverpool, and it's not entirely clear what occurred. And I'd also like to point out at this, uh, at this juncture that Massey burned pretty much everything he ever wrote, which makes uh, researching him quite, quite complicated here. Um, but uh, it's not entirely clear what happened in this meeting. But at some point, the governor reminded, and I think you can read it, that this threatened Massey that he could act in his constitutional capacity as commander in chief of the Dominion's forces to order the convoy's dispatch. Massey then bluntly informed the governor of his intention to leave. Liverpool recognized that this would spark an unprecedented constitutional crisis of a democratically elected Dominion government resigning over a breach of trust to the Crown's appointed representative. And so the governor backtracked and agreed to wait for a sufficient escort, but that escort was not to come for British warships. When the convoy finally deported, departed Wellington on October 16th, it did so under the protection of the Japanese battle cruiser Ibuki. These two episodes then uh, uh, ensured that New Zealand became the Admiralty's biggest critic over the next few years, quietly but insistently pointing out the problems with British security in the Far East. Massey collaborated with his Australian counterparts, including um, the Australian uh, firebrand Billy Hughes, for a new defense conference on this issue of the Pacific question. He called for the British government to send representatives out for a meeting, even agreeing to meet them in Ceylon or, or, or Vancouver. He also made it clear, though, that New Zealand had no intention of returning Samoa or any other captured territories at the end of the war. Massey made it clear that he placed no trust in the naval protection of the Anglo-Japanese alliance, informing the uh, 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 with, with the Lord Liverpool informing the colonial office that, quote, neither Australia nor Zealand will ever be convinced that in the future our peril is not in Japan. Next slide, please. Massey found an opportunity to make his case in the spring of 1917 when the British government under David Lloyd George convened an Imperial War Cabinet. Uh, with, with the Australian Premier Billy Hughes unable to attend, Massey became the Dominion's standard bearer for naval defense. As part of a subcommittee on enemy territories convened under Lord Curzon, Massey made an impassioned case for the future of New Zealand's maritime empire. As he explained to his colleagues, quote, we missed our chance in days gone past, and those chances will never come again. But there are possibilities there. I believe that New Zealand will, in time to come, be the governing center of a British Islands Federation, which will consist of the islands which we possess at the present time, and probably the other islands which, we, which may see their way to come in and join with us. So this subcommittee, which is actually a fascinating document, uh, produced a report, fascinating document, evolved into something of a buccaneering enterprise with, with even Canadian representatives laying claim to places like Greenland and the Falkland Islands, all in the name of Imperial Maritime Security. Massey also did add battle with the Admiralty over the future of British naval policy. During one of the very first meetings, the New Zealand delegation introduced a resolution demanding greater Admiralty consultation over the future of security in the Far East. The resolution suggested that independent Dominion navies would not just assist the Royal Navy, but actually relieve the Royal Navy's burden in far-flung waters and thus eliminate one of the more divisive issues plaguing the imperial relationship. Massey was furious that the first sea lord, John Jellicoe, had neglected to actually show up to the meeting at all. So he reminded Admiralty officials that the service and professional strategy were subservient to civilians and the political demands of the democratically elected governments of the Dominions. And I should say that Massey will ultimately come exceedingly close with Jellicoe when he serves as, uh, as, as Governor General of New Zealand in the 1920s, but at the time this was a very fractious relationship. Massey grandstanded by reading aloud the entire 1909 fleet unit memo, something like four hours for him to go all the way through this, um, at the end reminding his Dominion colleagues of its abandonment, 
by Winston Churchill's Admiralty in 1912. I concluded, quote, if there was ever a definite promise in this world, that was a definite promise. And I am sorry to say as a British citizen, as one who was born a British citizen, and who will die a British citizen, that so far as we were able to judge, there was never the slightest attempt made to keep that promise. The rhetorical arrow found its mark, and Massey secured a promise from the government, enshrined in a conference resolution for a post-war conference on the Pacific question. In the meantime, though, New Zealand faced further reminders of its vulnerability and isolation in the Pacific. While Massey was battling the Admiralty in London, a German auxiliary cruiser, the Wolf, operated in the sea lanes surrounding Australia, New Zealand, and the East Indies. The ship laid mines and sunk 35 merchant vessels before returning to Germany. In New Zealand, there was a fear that the Wolf might use its seaplane to actually launch an air raid on Wellington or Auckland. With its antiquated cruiser, the HMS Philomel remained dockside in a pitiful shape. The best the Dominion could do was arm several fishing trawlers. Quote, under the present condition, the country is absolutely powerless to take any action, warned the leader of the New Zealand Naval Forces. But <clears throat> Time constraints preclude all but a sort of brief synopsis of what happened next, and actually Jesse Tomlin and, and Louis Hillwood's papers uh, alluded to some of this early in the conference. But Massey returned to London in 1918 for an, another Imperial War uh, Conference, where he joined with the other Dominion leaders in staving off Admiralty efforts to uh, create, to, to, to revert back to this model of a common Imperial Navy. Instead, Massey demanded that Imperial authorities send a qualified expert to advise the Dominion on naval matters. The result was the 1919 Telephone Mission, carried out by the former, former First Sea Lord uh, uh, aboard the HMS New Zealand. And despite secret orders from the Admiralty to push for a single Navy scheme, Jellicoe encouraged Australia and New Zealand in their naval ambitions. Indeed, his widespread popularity and ultimately his good rapport with Massey ensured that, uh, that he would become the next Governor General, where he played an influential role, shaping what became known in 1921 as the New Zealand Division of the Royal Navy, a sort of liminal halfway house between, between uh, a single unified Navy scheme and an independent Dominion Navy. <laughs> Massey uh, also spearheaded the British Empire's efforts to retain German colonies after the war. Throughout 1918, Massey and, and the Australian Premier uh, Hughes berated their colleagues in the British cabinet about the strategic necessity of acquiring all the German colonies. I wonder, quote, if we could find some convincing argument for not annexing all the territories in the world, used one British cabinet member. Another warned, quote, it is really vital that we should not allow ourselves to be stampeded by the colonial imperialists one to another. Massey took this combative attitude to the Paris Peace Conference, where he successfully stared down Woodrow Wilson in demanding New Zealand's, quote, rightful spoils of war. He was successful. The Dominions retained Samoa as a League Nations mandate, beginning an exploitative colonial enterprise that lasted until 1962. But on the other hand, the politics of naval supremacy continued to be a thorn in New Zealand's relationship to this evolving continent. Delaco's proposal for a massive post-war Far Eastern fleet, cornerstone of British security east of Suez, foundered on the rocks of post-war retrenchment. And moreover, the Admiralty, and this is something we can talk about a little bit in Q&A, the Admiralty continued to drag its feet in assisting New Zealand uh, in its naval ambitions. Plans to acquire several light cruisers and a flotilla of submarines from the downsized Royal Navy were downgraded to just one older town-class light cruiser, the HMS Chatham. Though so certainly an improvement over the, uh, the HMS Philomel, um, the cruiser and, and others like it in the late 1920s spent their days mostly serving as a constabulary gunboat force, patrolling the new islands of New Zealand's maritime empire and combating anti-colonial movements. So to conclude, I hope that this paper shows the degree to which the politics of naval supremacy was one of the defining features in New Zealand's relationship with the evolving empire. Now, I'll conclude with one anecdote from the 1921 Imperial Conference. Um, this was one of the most important meetings of the history of the Commonwealth, with deliberations on topics as diverse as uh, the Anglo-Irish War, uh, Indian reforms, constitutional nature of Dominion autonomy, tariff reform, and the League of Nations. But for Massey, the most important matter was the naval arms race and the renewal of the Anglo-Japanese alliance. Throughout the conference, Massey became horrified that what he saw is the mortgaging of imperial security and aims of internationalism. 
indeed one of his very, very few surviving scraps of paper, a notebook from this meeting, reveals an almost obsessive mentality. The notebook contains very little in terms of formal prose, just fragmentary bits of the scrawl. Unity of empire appears quite frequently, as does, quote, responsibilities of sister states. Other phrases that, that appear include, quote, must act as a partnership, and dominions must have a voice in foreign policy, and rule Britannia. But more ominously, and it's on the back page, and it's underlined multiple times, New Zealand alone in the ocean. Thank you, John. Um, our next paper uh, is present, uh, Destroyed Your Basis in an Analysis of 1940 Negotiations Between the United States and Great Britain, presented by uh, Commander Jennifer Riggin Peters. She was commissioned in 1991 via the Naval ROTC program at the University of Illinois, where I got my, <laughs> from where I, whence I got my PhD. She began her career as an aerospace maintenance duty officer and later flew the S3B Viking as a naval flight officer. Jen holds master's degrees from the University of Florida, uh, the Florida Institute of Technology and the Harvard Kennedy School, and is currently pursuing a graduate certificate in international security uh, from the Harvard Extension School. Her primary research interest is indeed Anglo-American relations during the early period, the early period of World War II, 1939 to 1941. Jennifer? Thank you. morning. Thank you for being here. Um, as Professor Billy said, my paper is Discouraged for Bases, an analysis of the 1940 negotiations between the U.S. and Britain. Um, and I adapted it from a paper I was, or an article I was very uh, fortunate to have published in the Naval Institute's Naval History Online in April. At the beginning of World War II, Britain had the most powerful Navy in the world, yet the Royal Navy struggled to maintain maritime superiority in the face of the German U-boat threat. Britain reached out to the United States for help, and the two nations forged the win-win destroyers for bases deal that kept Britain in the war and helped turn the tide in World War II. This paper will seek to analyze how the Britain and the U.S. were able to negotiate this agreement, which was so beneficial for both parties. Next slide, please. By the time Winston Churchill became Prime Minister on the 10th of May 1940, Germany had already invaded Poland, Denmark, and Norway, and on that very morning began its invasion of the Netherlands, Luxembourg, Belgium, and France, so it's kind of closing in on them. Um, Germany's U-boats were decimating merchant shipping, trying to starve Britain into submission by sinking ships carrying food and other vital goods to the island. At the same time, Britain feared a cross-channel invasion from Germany. The Royal Navy had two vital missions, protecting merchant shipping and guarding against a cross-channel invasion, both of which required destroyers. 11 of Britain's 179 destroyers had already been lost since the beginning of the war. New destroyers were being built in British shipyards, but they wouldn't be ready until 1941. Despite having the most powerful fleet in the world, Britain found itself in need of help from international partners in order to maintain its maritime superiority. On the 15th of May, 1940, just five days after taking office, Winston Churchill wrote to um, U.S. President Franklin D. Roosevelt asking for, quote, the loan of 40 or 50 of your older destroyers. Next slide, please. So Roosevelt may have wanted to help, he turned Churchill down. 50 ships represented 20% of the U.S. Navy's destroyer force at that time. Initially, Roosevelt may have had a hard time seeing past the idea that the United States would be losing 50 destroyers, ships that the U.S. would need to counter the Nazi threat on its own behalf if it came to that. If this had been a typical win-lose negotiation, the U.S. would have tried to get as much money as possible in exchange for those destroyers. But of course, at that point in the war, Britain couldn't afford to pay money for the ships. Many factors were working against the deal on the U.S. side. To begin with, the U.S. was a neutral party. It had not yet entered the war. U.S. law at that time seemed to prohibit the transfer of arms to a belligerent. Public opinion in the U.S. was mixed. Many people were against Hitler's aggression in Europe, but there was a sizable isolationist sentiment. And Roosevelt was campaigning for an unprecedented third term and was treading lightly. Most of all, Roosevelt feared that Britain wouldn't be able to resist a German invasion, 
and if the U.S. gave Britain 50 destroyers, what would happen to those ships if Britain fell? Next slide, please. Churchill refused to give up on the idea of U.S. destroyers and ultimately bringing the U.S. into the war. However, in any situation, it's a good idea to have a backup plan, or in negotiation terms, a best alternative to a negotiated agreement, acronym BATNA. So I apologize if I use the term BATNA throughout this paper, but that's what it means. It's basically um, your backup plan. Churchill's BATNA was to try to persuade other countries with large navies to either join the Allies or to remain neutral. The 1939 edition of Jane's Fighting Ships lists the countries with the largest navies in the world as Britain, United States, Japan, France, Italy, Germany, and then seventh, the Soviet Union. To counter the German U-boat threat and maintain maritime superiority, Britain would need help from one or more large navies. Churchill considered Japan. His biographer, Martin Gilbert, writes that on the 17th of May, 1940, Churchill went, quote, to the Japanese embassy for lunch with the ambassador, Shigemitsu, toward whose government the utmost amiability appeared necessary, despite its military dominance in China. But, of course, no headway was made with Japan's third largest navy. The Soviet Union had signed an aggression pact with Germany. Oh, you can go back, sorry. That's okay. Um, the Soviet Union had signed a non-aggression pact with Germany the previous August. So no attempt was made to try to get their seventh largest navy to join the Allies. Churchill held no hope that Italy would join the Allies, but he did try to persuade Mussolini to keep Italy's fifth largest navy neutral. And his efforts failed when Italy entered the war on Germany's side on the 10th of May, excuse me, the 10th of June, 1940. That month, Britain even went so far as to seize four brand new Swedish destroyers, which had just been built in an Italian shipyard before they could be delivered to Sweden. Unfortunately, Britain accidentally bombed these ships a few weeks later while they were being held at the Faroe Islands. Britain's last remaining BATNA was to keep its ally France, or at least France's navy, in the war. In early June, France was in danger, serious danger of falling. At the final meeting of the Anglo-French Supreme War Council on the 12th of June, 1940, Churchill approached Admiral Francois Darlan, Commander-in-Chief of the French Navy. Darlan, he said, I hope you will never surrender the fleet. And Admiral Darlan replied, there is no question of doing so. It would be contrary, contrary excuse me, to our naval tradition and honor. The German army marched into Paris on the 14th of June. Two days later, France asked Germany for an armistice going against its agreement with Britain not to seek a separate peace. Britain now stood alone against Nazi Germany. After the fall of France, Churchill held out hope that the French fleet would sail for Britain and continue to resist the Nazis. Admiral Darlan's promise had been reiterated on more than one occasion, but for more than two weeks after France joined, or excuse me, after France asked Germany for an armistice, the French fleet, the fourth largest in the world, made no move to join the British. Britain was running out of options for acquiring the ships necessary to maintain their maritime superiority. Next slide, please. Churchill decided to take action. On the 3rd of J uh, July, 1940, he initiated Operation Catapult, which, quote, comprised the simultaneous seizure, control, or effective disablement or destruction of all the accessible French fleet. At ports outside France, Royal Navy officers presented their French counterparts with four choices. Sail with the British fleet and continue to fight. Sail with reduced crews for a British port. Sail for ports in the West Indies and disarm, disarm or be destroyed. At Portsmouth and Plymouth, England, the British took control of two French battleships, four light cruisers, eight destroyers, some submarines, and hundreds of smaller craft. Crews willingly came ashore, except on board the submarine Surcouf, on which three lives were lost during the seizure. At Alexandria, Egypt, the French admiral in charge agreed to disable his fleet, one battleship, four cruisers, and several smaller ships. Sadly, the situation was very different in the French ship, um, with the French ships at Algeria. At the port of Mers el Kaber in near Oran, two French battlecruisers, two battleships, and several other ships were in port when Royal Navy Admiral James Somerville prevented the French, excuse me, presented French Admiral Marcel Bruno <coughs> Gentoul with the terms. Gentil was given six hours to decide. Somehow, the option to sail his ships to the West Indies and disarm was omitted from the alternatives presented to him. But in any event, Gentil refused all terms. 
British intelligence intercepted a message from Darlan's chief of staff telling Finsoul, quote, you are to answer force with force. The night before, Britain's first sea lord, Admiral Dudley Pound, had sent Admiral Somerville a message which read, quote, you are charged with one of the most disagreeable and difficult tasks that a British admiral has ever been faced with, but we have complete confidence in you and rely on you to carry it out relentlessly. When Gensoul's six-hour window was up, the Royal Navy fired upon the French ships. As Martin Gilbert writes, quote, it was at 5.55 p.m. that Somerville gave the order to open fire, and within five minutes, he was himself heavily engaged. At 6.04 p.m., he ordered the ceasefire in order to give the French crews the opportunity to leave their ships. The battle had lasted nine minutes. The battleship Britannia had blown up. The battlecruiser Dunkirk had run aground. The battleship Provence was beached, and in those few minutes, more than 1,250 French sailors had been killed. Churchill was deeply upset to learn of the tragedy at Oran, but he knew that allowing Germany to have the French fleet might well have meant the end for Britain. Though Operation Catapult had resulted in some free French ships joining Britain, the UK still desperately needed those US destroyers. An additional 18 British destroyers had been lost since Churchill's first appeal. And throughout this whole time period, he kept writing to Roosevelt and kept getting the answer no. On the 31st of July, Churchill told Roosevelt, quote, Mr. President, with great respect, I must tell you that in the long history of the world, this is a thing to do now. Next slide, please. With the fall of France, the United States' own BATNA, or um, backup plan, had been greatly reduced. Now, Britain was the only thing standing between Hitler and the United States. Roosevelt and his administration worked to address the many roadblocks to the deal. Roosevelt, one of Roosevelt's advisors pointed out that giving the ships to Britain could actually improve U.S. national security. It would allow the ships to be used to fight Germany immediately, whereas keeping them would have meant Germany would have been more likely to defeat Britain and come after the United States next. I argue that this realization was the key turning point in the deal. Once the situation was framed this way, that giving the ships away was in both countries' mutual interest, Roosevelt began to envision how a win-win deal could be made. At some point, um, the suggestion was made to Roosevelt to ask for land in the British colonies in the Caribbean and Atlantic for use as U.S. naval and air bases. And in fact, I believe Lord Lothian, the ambassador, is the one who uh, suggested this in the first place. Such bases would help protect the U.S. eastern seaboard as well as the Panama Canal. And this would have appealed to Roosevelt, who in 1938 had told Congress, quote, adequate defense means that for the protection not only of our coast, but also our communities far, far removed from the coast, we must keep any potential enemy money, many hundreds of miles away from our continental limits. During a meeting between Roosevelt and his cabinet on the 2nd of August, 1940, there was a, quote, long discussion in regard to devising ways and means to sell directly or indirectly 50 or 60 World War old destroyers to Great Britain. It was the general opinion, without any dissenting voice, that the survival of the British Isles under German attack might very possibly depend on getting, they're getting these destroyers. Dean Acheson and other prominent lawyers penned an op-ed in the New York Times on the 11th of August, 1940, arguing to the public that there were no legal impediments to the deal and it could be done by executive action. They also pointed out in the op-ed, quote, in the present state of the world, the maintenance of British sea power is of inestimable advantage to us in terms of our own national defense, and the release of at least 50 of our overage destroyers for sale to Great Britain is not only compatible with what is vitally important to the safeguarding of our own national defense. Roosevelt's political problems were eased when Wendell Wilkie became the Republican nominee for president instead of an isolationist candidate. Wilkie agreed not to make the destroyer deal an issue in the campaign. Roosevelt also had to smooth the ruffled feathers of a powerful senator from his own party, Senator David Walsh of Massachusetts, chairman of the Senate Naval Affairs Committee, who opposed transferring the ships to Britain. Roosevelt told Walsh that the destroyers were, quote, on their last legs anyway, and argued that the value of the bases the U.S. hoped to get in return greatly outweighed those of the ships. Next slide, please. Once the U.S. realized that giving the Britain the destroyers would benefit both sides, negotiations began in earnest. 
Britain's primary interest was in getting more destroyers to fight Germany. The U.S. was interested in gaining the bases in the Western Atlantic from which to defend the U.S. shore. Each side's overarching goal, however, was to stop Hitler. The two countries used a win-win negotiation approach to achieve both their mutual and individual goals. In the end, Britain got 50 World War I-era destroyers, known as four stackers or four pipers, from the U.S. The ships were old, outmoded, outmoded and had poor handling qualities. But as Admiral George Creasy, British director of anti-submarine warfare, later said, quote, any destroyer that could steam, shoot, and drop depth charges was worth its weight in gold in the summer of 1940. Mm -hmm. The destroyers had a powerful effect on the morale of the British, British people who, in their darkest hour, felt that the American people supported them. On the 6th of September, 1940, the first eight destroyers which were fully loaded with ammunition and food and other stores, sailed for Canada where the ships were transferred to Royal Navy crews. In giving up the destroyers, the U.S. gained a stronger ally who would fight Hitler all the more effectively before it entered the war. Next slide, please. The U.S. got bases in Newfoundland, Bermuda, the Bahamas, Jamaica, St. Lucia, Trinidad, Antigua, and British Guyana for its defense. Churchill obtained agreement from each colony to site a U.S. base within their territory. Transferring sovereignty was, of course, off the table, but the compromise was 99-year leases. Long-term leases allowed the U.S. to make capital improvements to maximize each base's warfighting capabilities. Construction of the base began within months. Bases began within months. The bases enabled the U.S. to protect the Western Hemisphere from looming Nazi aggression keeping the enemy well away from its continental limits, as Roosevelt had proposed in 1938. And the bases didn't just protect the U.S., but the Panama, the, the Panama Canal, the British colonies themselves, and all of North and South America. There were intangibles that each side gained as well. For political reasons, Roe, uh, Churchill wanted the bases to be gifts, freely given to the American people, while Roosevelt wanted the destroyer for bases deal characterized as a quid pro quo. Mm the two sides reached a compromise. The bases in Newfoundland and Bermuda were characterized as outright, outright gifts as gestures of goodwill while the other bases were exchanged for the ships. Next slide, please. Roosevelt wanted the UK to promise to send its fleet to America if Britain fell to Germany, and Churchill could not agree to this. He was being asked to give the same promise to Roosevelt that Francis Admiral Verlon had given him to turn over his fleet to an ally in the event his country was conquered by Germany. Um, in his mind, Verlon had reneged on that promise, forcing Britain to attack her former ally at Iran. More important, Churchill could not risk the blow to British morale if he were to even entertain the possibility of losing to Germany by making such a promise. Perhaps because of what had happened in Iran, Roosevelt no longer needed an explicit promise from Churchill. And months later, um, Roosevelt A. Perry Hopkins told Churchill's private secretary, Jacques Colville, that Oran had convinced Roosevelt that Britain would continue to fight. So instead, Roosevelt asked Churchill to reiterate his remarks from his speech to Parliament on the 4th of June, which Churchill happily did. And that famous speech ends, that's a long speech. This is just part of it, obviously. We'll sh we shall fight on the beaches, we shall fight on the landing grounds, etc. Um, we shall never surrender, and even which, if I do, uh, which I do not for a moment believe, this island or a large part of it were subjugated and starving, then our empire beyond the seas, and this is the part that Roosevelt wanted Churchill to reiterate, armed and guarded by the British fleet, would carry on the struggle, until in good, God's good time, the new world, with all its power and might, steps forth to the rescue and liberation of the old. Next slide, please. And as an aside, Admiral Darlan did keep his promise to Churchill in the end. When Germany tried to seize the French fleet at Toulon in November 1942, French naval commanders scuttled 77 warships to prevent them from falling into German hands. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, the destroyers for bases deal showed that the U.S. and Britain shared what Churchill later called a special relationship. The deal gave Britain the means and faith to keep fighting. Even though it would be more than a year before the U.S. joined the war, it was no longer a neutral country. It was firmly on Britain's side. 
In March 1941, Lend Lease was approved by Congress to send Britain even more material aid. The U.S. entered the war following the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in December 1941. So instead of focusing strictly on what they would lose or gain by transferring the destroyers, the U.S. and Britain found a way to enhance both countries' national security, demonstrating that working together with allies yields greater results than one nation can achieve on its own. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ken. Our third uh, presenter, uh, James Levy, uh, will be presenting on the collapse of British naval brand strategy and the coming of imperial overstretch in the weather coming in Um James and I, I think, are, are knowing each other goes all the way back to West Point, the summer seminar of 1999. Correct. Yes, I've known James longer than any of the other uh, panelists today. Um, he uh, earned his P MA in political science at the New School for Social Research and uh, followed that with his PhD. University of Wales, where he studied, I, I believe the director was Michael Simpson, uh, that's correct. Um, since earning his PhD, he has uh, published two books, uh, initially the Royal Navy's Home Fleet World War II, uh, and subsequently Appeasement and Rearmament in Britain, 1936-1939. Uh, in addition, he has published several articles, uh, most recently, uh, the development of British naval aviation, preparing, preparing the fleet air on for war, 1934, 1939. Uh, and I will turn matters over to James now. Thanks. All right, thanks. Uh, if my enunciation is poor through this mask, please point it out to me so that I speak more clearly. Um, hey, that's, that's awesome. good. Uh, slides are up. We're ready to go. Um, this paper uh, comes out of a, actually my, I've been thinking about this problem since my master's thesis, which was in international relations back in the dark age, um, uh, which is this, the, the issue of relative decline for the, the Britain and the empire and the, uh, the idea of whether this was along a continuum or if there is a rupture. Right? Uh, and historians have been banging back and forth about this for, for decades. Um, a lot of it goes back to, well, in, for, from the naval perspective, I'd say uh, Paul Kennedy's book, The Rise and Fall of British Naval Mastery, which came out in 1976. Um, and uh, so uh, when I was looking at this paper, when I was thinking about writing about it, because I come back to this problem over and over again, um, and I, I, I never get a quite a complete answer, but I do have at least uh, kind of some provisional thoughts, and I'd like to give them today. Um, okay, can we go to the first slide? I hope it's readable. Okay, in December of uh, 1937, the British Chiefs of Staff Committee wrote to the cabinet uh, to warn them of an impending crisis in imperial and national defense. Uh, they informed their political masters, and I quote, right, we cannot foresee a time when our defense forces will be strong enough to safeguard our trade, territory, and vital interests against Germany, Italy, and Japan at the same time. We cannot exaggerate the importance from the point of view of imperial defense of any political or international action which could be taken to reduce the number of our potential enemies and to gain the support of potential allies. Um, I want to point out that there, there's uh, the, 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 the idea here is we have national defense, imperial defense, national interest. There's something unspoken here. Um, but I think it's very important, and it's unspoken because I, I, I don't think anybody, I think everyone took it for granted, that it, this included the notion of Britain as an imperial power and as an independent great power. Independent great power status by implication, the idea that a state can, as best one can do in the international order, make one's decisions for oneself. 
that the locus of decision making is not in a foreign capital, that you are not constrained by subordination to a foreign nation, but that you are the master of your own fate. I, I thought of this because you had mentioned yesterday you were talking about the issue of Australia and New Zealand functioning within, uh, you know, their, their only, the only answer to their defense needs was to function within a hegemon, a hegemonic project. And uh, British leaders, right, in 1937 still very much see themselves as being that hegemon. It is critical to uh, remember that the British chief of staff, and especially the Royal Navy, on their first Sea Lord Baron Chatfield, considered the essence of British grand strategy as the defense of the metropole and the empire, preservation of the British trading system, and securing British naval supremacy vis-a-vis -vis likely enemies. That's important. If you look at the at the, the planning documents at the time, they're, the British are still talking about naval supremacy. They're not. They're not talking about we're going to be supreme over the Americas. They're talking about any likely enemy. Right? The assumption is that um, unless some disaster befalls the empire, they're not going to have to go to war with the Americans. Um, so when Chatfield is writing and talking about reestablishing British naval supremacy, that's the context in which he's talking against potential enemies. Right? Who are we going to have to fight? Um, the following paper will use the crisis period of November and December 1941 to assess the chief of staff statement in the context of British grand strategy. Okay. And uh, this is something I, I really want to stress because uh, it came to me after reading, you know, hundreds of books over the years that uh, where U.S. national interests are often taken as a given in discussions of U.S. grand strategy in World War II, Right? The Americans are working towards something, building towards something. Right? The grand strategic imperatives of the British Empire are often ignored, disparaged, or dismissed. This is largely um, because our narrative of the war is subsumed by Churchill's obsession with gaining American entry into the war, on the one hand, and the ex post facto understanding that the British Empire would collapse post-war on the other. Okay? What the British are trying to accomplish by this war is, is something, at least from the perspective of the Admiralty, something way beyond survival. They don't just want to survive the war. Right? They want to come out of it with a whole skin. They want to come out of it right, looking something like what they look like going into it. This is very important because when the histories get written post-war, they get written by people who are who understand that Britain doesn't come out of the war in 1945, looking like it did in 1938. But the planners, <laughs> they don't know that. We can't read that backwards, at least from when we're read, when we're trying to understand what the heck the Admiralty is trying to do. This is the context of uh, British grand strategy. Is, uh, in this context, pardon me, British grand strategy is largely irrelevant because it is conflated with allied strategy, assumed to have been doomed or not taken into consideration because it became irrelevant post war. However, the men who wrote the cabinet in 1937 did not think that British grand strategy and British imperial interests were irrelevant or doomed. And they didn't think that way in 1941 either. And British debate during the war and those leading up to the crisis of late 1941 and beyond must be seen in the context of an ongoing discourse over policy objectives and how the actors involved understood them. Britain 
the dominions and the empire were holding their own in the summer of 1941. Again, World War II has ups and downs for everybody. Right? We forget that in the summer of 41, the British are breathing a tremendous sigh of relief. Right? The commitment of the vast bulk of the German army in the Luftwaffe to Operation Barbarossa left the United Kingdom physically secure. Right? There ain't going to be no Operation Sea Lion. Britain is safe at least as long as the Soviet Union can stay in the war. Right? That's something that Churchill understood instantaneously. It's something that's a kind of overlooked in the, the battles of pro and con over Churchill's handling of the war is one of the things that he did that he understood right away was that the Soviet Union, the entry of the Soviet Union into the war was going to buy the British time. At the very least, it was going to buy them a year. If the Soviets could stay in the war, much, so much the better. Okay. The first convoys in support of Britain's new Soviet allies were sent out that summer and proceeded without loss, interestingly enough. Um, and the U-boat war in the North Atlantic was swinging Britain's way in the summer of 1941. The happy time was over. Right? The struggle in North Africa was stalled uh, as for both sides, while Malta was holding on uh, because most of the Luftwaffe had been switched from the Mediterranean to the Eastern Front. If the Soviet Union could survive, Germany and Italy would be contained and in, a, and in serious strategic trouble. The looming question in all this was how Japan would respond to uh, her predicament in China and her growing confrontation with the United States. The Royal Navy had little doubt that a war with Japan was likely. And from the summer of 1941 began the complex planning and logistical steps needed to send a fleet east. Uh, a lot of the historiography, of course, deals with the dispatch of Force uh, Z, um, but that wasn't what the Admiralty were thinking. That was a political imposition. The Admiralty had a much longer range plan for what they wanted which was to build up an Eastern fleet sometime around April, May, 1942. Ships are going into dry dock, refits are underway, plans are in the, in the works, right, to send a fleet east. Um, so th this all, of course, falls into this idea of the main fleet to Singapore. Um, and after, the combination after Taranto, Mattapan, sinking of the Bismarck, Soviet Union comes in, is brought into the war. The British can now think in terms, and the Admiralty is thinking in terms of the main fleet to Singapore. Uh, because they think that a war with Japan at this point is, is becoming an inevitability. Right? So Chris Bell talks about this because Chris Bell says there never was a singular. Singapore strategy. There were a whole bunch of them. Right? It's like when you read uh, the stuff on war plan arms. There was no there was no war plan arms. There were a whole bunch of war plan arms. Right? Um, now, the, the, that had always been popular with the Navy. It was less and less popular. Really, the critical juncture is the Abyssinian crisis and the follow-up to that as First Chamberlain and then Churchill, in a perfect continuity between the two of them, see Europe, Germany first. Europe is the battlefield. The RAF is got to be built up at the expense, if at the expense of the Navy. Right. There, there, there's a there's a continuity 38, 39, 40, 41 in in, in the political sphere. The Navy does not like that. Right. Chatfield hates it. Right. That's one of the reasons why Chatfield gets canned by Churchill. Right. It's good. He don't like this at all. He wants money for the Navy. He wants a great Navy. He wants the Navy east. 
but um, Chamberlain and Churchill want the Navy in European waters. Right? And they want more money for the ARIA, less money for the Navy. Um, uh, so the British are now thinking very seriously about what are we going to do, how are we going to do this, the Admiralty planners are, are, are setting the wheels in motion. Because it's an enormous undertaking right, to get the fleet to Singapore, or actually what the, what the, the Navy wants to get the fleet to Ceylon. Right? Um, Singapore is, they're thinking of as a, as a forward base not at the main base. And so you get into this, this these wranglings, right? Um, and uh, so this leads to planning, and which leads to my next slide, which I hope is readable, at least a little bit, um, which is the kind of, this is as best as I can recreate it, uh, the plan, the overall plan the overall concept of how they want to be deploying the fleet in the spring of 1946. Okay. And it involves, of course, a, 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 a radical shift right, in naval power east. Right? The biggest fleet is going to be the eastern fleet. That's, that's what the Admiralty wants. Uh, now, the interesting thing for me as somebody who, who did work on the home fleet and, and these issues is this fleet is very similar to the fleet that they envisioned in the summer and early fall of 1939. Right? When they talked about if Japan jumped into the war after, after, after Poland, Right. What if, and what are we going to do? Right. Uh, basically, the argument was we're going to we're going to send the five R class battleships, Nelson, Rodney, Repulse, and Ark Royal, to the Indian Ocean, and we're going to pretty much abandon the Mediterranean. That was the plan. And it's interesting that in 1941, this, this, in 42, there's an enormous continuity in the idea of what should constitute a bureaucracy in the life, right? What are we going to do? Well, what, what, what did we think we were going to do last year and the year before? Here we go. We're going to send this force to the east. Right? And, um, and we're going to have a, a proper fine home fleet and a decent Mediterranean fleet and a, and a an existing, you know, the existing force, Eagle and Malaya will hold down Force H uh, as, a, as, a, as a rump, right? And, uh, you know, I have, an, I have here on my own list, you know, if you want to know, uh, Barham and Furious were supposed to be in refits, and Anson and Howe were supposed to be fitting out, and nobody could figure out where illustrious is. It's funny because you look at you look at the documents and you look at the planning. You're like, where the heck was Illustrious going to go? And the answer is, uh, it does. It, nobody has pointed out where Illustrious is going to go. Um, Illustrious might have wound up in a bunch of different places when her repairs in the United States at Norfolk finally were completed, right? Which was around the, the completion date was December, January, 1941, 1942. Um, so you've got this, this planning process at the end. And then events start to overtake the planners, right? And um, one of the things I also want to point out at this, uh, this juncture is I am not arguing that this would have worked, right? that this would have solved, this, this deployment was adequate to the crisis that was looming. Maybe there would have been, maybe it wouldn't have been, uh, probably it wasn't going to be. But nonetheless, this is a big, we're, we're looking at here a British solution to a British problem. Not an allied solution to an allied problem. Their fourth deployments are still completely based on Britain 
being able to handle its own strategic concerns. Uh, so, I'm, as I say, I'm, not, I'm not arguing that this forced deployment would have been adequate to the crisis that overcame them, but I am saying that we have to keep it in the context of how they were thinking about it. Right? Um, the biggest problem, of course, is something that they, they haven't taken into consideration, which is that, and I, I really usually hate the term, but you can argue that the Japanese have in, initiated a revolution in military affairs with the creation of their carrier fleet um, as a compensatory force to overcome the, the fact that their battle fleet is over is outnumbered by the Americans and they need a they need something to close the gap. Right? And what the, what they decide is the factor that's going to even the score there is a mass carrier force. Uh, the British don't have that. They don't envision it. They need carriers every place. They're not fighting one enemy on one front. There's no possibility that they can strip all their aircraft carriers from everywhere and put them into one fort. It doesn't work. It can't be done. Japanese can do it. British can't. So you've got that working against the, the British. Right. They have no answer to what the Japanese can put in the field in terms of air power. And it, 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 it's not just a bunch of how do we compare this plane with that plane. And it, it's a bigger problem. It's a global strategic problem. Right? The United States can send its carrier force to the Pacific. The Japanese can send their carrier force against the Americans. The British need to carry it everywhere. And now you've got the problem that the, the, uh, the conflict between the Americans and the Japanese is accelerating, and Churchill wants to jump on this bandwagon. He can neither change what the Americans are doing, nor does he want to. Because if the American confrontation with Japan ends in war, Churchill sees this as a, as a tremendous victory, a tremendous success. He's not thinking about the strategic implications for the empire of what's going to happen when the war comes. The Admiralty is. And this causes a big rift. But Dudley Pound and the Admiralty and their political boss, A.V. Alexander, are arguing we need a comprehensive, balanced fleet for the East. The big three in the cabinet, right, Churchill, Attlee, and Eaton, are all arguing. We need to make a political statement to the Americans and the Australians. And we need to do it now, not six or eight or ten months from now. And then this is even, this situation is compounded by the fact that in the, uh, in the, uh, the, uh, what is it? Was it the ABC talks, right? Between the, the US and Britain, right? the Americans are pushing the British to deploy forward. The Admiralty wants the ships in Ceylon, the Americans want the ships in Singapore. And Churchill is desperate to appease the Americans. The Repulse and Prince of Wales get their orders to go to Singapore. And then we have, you know, one of those little historical hissy fits. Town, who had been against this whole thing, as the intelligence comes in, 
uh, refuses to cancel those orders. This is Winston's baby. This is what he wants. Let him go. He had lost too many arguments and was it was like, I'm not going to intervene or put my head on the chopping block to stop this at the, at the, at the, at the, at the 11th hour. If, if Winston and the cabinet want them there, that's where they can go. And of course, they go there and wind up all getting sucked. Right? But this is only the this is only the, the the end of a disastrous month for the British. Right? In in a month and a week, Ark Royal goes down. Barham goes down. Renan and Repulse go down. Queen Elizabeth and Valiance go down. In one month, the next slide, but the entire strategic situation is wrecked. British losses in that six week period are absolutely crushing because the units that were needed to be in the East are now scattered. Right? Nothing is in the right place. When the war comes, right, everything's out of whack. The Med's wide open. The East is wide open. A whole bunch of ships are, are, are uh, under repair either in British or American dockyards. Thousands of miles from where they need to be. And what I would argue is the, the, the escalating series of disasters that flow from them. It's a horrific, it's probably the worst six months in British naval history. Everything from the, 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 the I have a, I have like a list right here. And it's unbelievable, right? We've got the Channel Dash, PQ-17, right? The Harpoon Convoy disaster. I mean, Fortitude failed to, to relieve Malta. There's a whole series, right? After Command gets smashed. The Royal Navy is, is, is in complete disarray. And I would argue that this is all an outgrowth of, of this is the moment in which Britain goes from a position where it can at least in theory solve its own strategic problems. To being utterly incapable of solving the monster's problem. It goes from needing American assistance to being now utterly dependent on American naval power. So, is this a rupture in the system? I think it is. I think we can. I think we can kind of put our finger on a moment when Britain went from the British uh, imperial system or the British imperial structure that can kind of sort of handle its own problems to it absolutely positively cannot. Uh, as I say, whatever chance the British may have had of meeting the challenge of a simultaneous war with Germany, Italy, and Japan as an independent great power was dead. Time, losses, and new enemy capabilities had finished it off. The collapse of the British position in Asia would prove a catastrophe for British grand strategy. And the Royal Navy never lost sight of this. Right? They knew that this was this was it. 
The planned redeployment of British naval assets to the Indian Ocean had been likely a forlorn hope, but it was the only chance the British had of maintaining their strategic goals of economic autonomy, naval supremacy, and independent great power status. It can never be known if, if the war happened in April, if, if April 7th, 1942 had been the day of infamy instead of December 7th, uh, and the Japanese showed up in the Indian Ocean in August of 42 rather than April, if things would have been different. But it's clear that those, that window, the fact that the war came when it did, and that the timetable for when the crisis happened was being decided in Tokyo and Washington, not London, was, was dramatic and decisive. At the end of December 1941, the, night, the nightmare scenario of the interwar chiefs of staff had come true. The British Empire was involved in a war against Germany, Italy, and Japan. Losses in the Mediterranean had, as had been feared since as early as the Abyssinian crisis of 1936, left the empire extremely vulnerable. Plans to parry a Japanese blow, blow via a major redistribution of the Royal Navy assets had been preempted, and the loss of 4C had only made a serious situation desperate. Brilliant innovations in land-based and sea-based naval air power by the Japanese, along with the daring skill and technology that the Italians showed at Alexandria, right, had left the Royal Navy in the lurch. Right? Paul Kennedy's moment of imperial overstretch had arrived. All the major failures of the Royal Navy in 1942, the defeat of ABDA, the inability of Somerville to face up to the Japanese when they did show up in April of 1942 in the Indian Ocean, right? the Channel Dash, right? the vigorous harpoon fiascos, right? the destruction of PQ-17, all arose out of the parlous state of the Royal Navy that found itself fighting a three-ocean war with a weakened two-ocean Navy. The warning issued by the Chiefs of Staff in 1937 had manifested itself in spades, and an inflection point in global history had been reached. Lord Chatfield's dream of a revitalized British trading bloc protected by a resurgent Royal Navy had not come to pass, while the promise of a new powerful ally in the United States bestowed no long-term aid on the plane of imperial grand strategy. The American alliance would unquestionably hasten the end of the war, but its impact on Great Britain's position vis-a-vis -vis the empire and the commonwealth was almost certainly negative. British naval power would reassert itself at, at the time of the torch landing and at the victory at the Barents Sea in uh, December 42, uh, but only because of the influence of American naval power on the global balance a power being exercised, that is, American naval power, not to the benefit of British imperial grand strategy, but with an eye to a new hegemonic order in which Britain was assigned merely a subaltern role. Thank you. Thank, and thank you, James. And thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, John. Um, I'm, we've got... Uh, 1133 now, I'm going to keep my comments pretty minimal uh, to ensure that we have uh, plenty of time for questions. I, I may, I reserve the right to jump back in <laughs> at some future point, but I, I want to focus on two of the overarching things. And it, it, anybody who's heard my comments and questions in earlier panels will, can probably guess what they are. Money and people. Um, first of all, uh, uh, James alludes to uh, Paul Kennedy's imperial overstretch uh, and, and the rise and fall of British naval mastery, which wouldn't call Paul quite an economic determinist uh, outright, but he's pretty damn close to it. <laughs> um, and, and, and more so in the rise and fall of the great powers, perhaps, than in British naval mastery. But underpinning British naval mastery is the ability to raise a lot of money to pay for a very expensive navy. Uh, and uh, I, I'm going to introduce John Darwin in the British world system here. Darwin argues that the financial underpinnings for that 
naval power always rested on somewhat shaky foundations. It was fragile, uh, perhaps is the best way to say. But the fragility really manifests itself in the, in the post-World War I period. It is impossible, if you will, to put the British world system back together completely. So many assets have been drained. Um, but the, the always fragile foundations are outright shaky. But John's paper seems to be to suggest that even prior to World War One, money was an issue. Uh, I'm interested in knowing why did Churchill scrap the Greek concept, the three unit concept? Was it on grounds of economy or is it on grounds of strategy, i.e., these forces need to be deployed somewhere else? Or was it a combination of the two? Um, likewise, why are the British so acutely assured of destroyers given the experience of World War I? Um, perhaps it was a consequence of the Washington London uh, uh, Naval Treaty. Uh, 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 if you will, mindset, except of course destroyers weren't directly produced in the Washington and London treaties, they're about capital ships. Was it because of Mahanian emphasis on the big gun, the, uh, the, gun, uh, the gun club? Um, uh, was it because the British believed in Aztec they had a solution to the submarine menace? Um, uh, but you know, as Jen says, the British can't afford to pay the United States outright for the destroyers, even if that had been on the table. Um, so it, this again comes back, it seems to me, to money. Um, likewise, the, the Navy guys recognize in 1937 they don't have a fleet adequate to meet the worst case scenario, uh, nor are they likely to get the money to create a fleet to meet the worst case scenario is because there simply isn't enough money. Is this money being misappropriated towards the RAF, according to you know, enlightened you know, British naval thinking, or is there some other problem at work here? And there are so many important personalities involved in this that I'm not going to try to deal with them all. Um, uh, we can focus obviously on Churchill, who is an instrumental player in all three cases. He emerges as a villain in John's paper. He emerges as a hero in Jennifer's paper. I get the sense that he emerges as a villain once again uh, in James' paper, James's paper, uh, although that's not, he's making a political statement at the expense of sound naval strategy, which probably makes him a villain, at least according to naval strategists. Um, there are many other things I could raise. The, the Anglo-Japanese alliance we heard yesterday uh, was, the, was the paper on Balfour. By the late early 1920s, seems to have been looked upon more favorably by the Australians and New Zealanders than it had been prior to World War One. They don't want to see it scrapped. Is this true of Massey as well? The, the New Zealand. Yeah. Uh, I, I, you know, in, in this particular case, I think uh, Jellico serves to kind of, I think, grease the wheels in terms of, uh, they're much more uh, aware. First off, it's not under their direct control. It's finance. But right, in right. But, but right. Um, uh, Ian McKibben's done some interesting work showing the way in which Jellicoe's term of, of uh, governor general actually sort of skirted the constitutional boundaries in a way that, that allowed him to play a role as both governor general as well as as, as kind of naval advisor, right, right, right. So he does a good job of explaining. Yeah. Massey understands that, that New Zealand is, is, is on the right. right, right, right. Okay, uh, I'm going to stop there. Uh, give uh, all three panelists a, a a chance to deal with the themes that I have suggested, if they choose to, uh, and if not, or if, once they have done so, we'll just open things up for questions. Okay. Yeah. Oh, um, well, the, 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 I think that the, 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 the difficulty here, and it, it, we go back to it over and over again as a historian, is that no one else has ever gotten, no other statesman has ever gotten the opportunity 
to write his own place into history the way Churchill did. Yeah. And so his assumption tended to become generalized assumption. Right? And so right, what is it what separates Churchill from some of the other players in London? It's to what extent do you think that do you believe in the Americans by which they can be reasoned with, they can be tricked, they can be played, they can be used to our advantage or not? Right. Um, and I would say the general consensus of the Admiralty is that the Americans are going to act in the manner that's good for the Americans. And not for us. And Churchill's belief, Churchill holds on to this belief. Uh, if you, uh, I think, if you read the tea leaves, uh, it's it, it's in Alan Brooks' diaries until about August of 1944. Mm -hmm. That the Americans can be molded, cajoled, talked into whatever we need them to do. And it's 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 around the summer of 1944 where Churchill suddenly comes to the conclusion, uh oh, no. Right. Alan Brooke describes him spending several weeks, you know, Churchill spending several several weeks in August of 1944, drunk and in a very foul mood, <laughs> because he realizes that the that that Roosevelt and Stalin are simply talking over his head. He's there to be eloquent, not to make decisions. Roosevelt and Stalin are making the decisions now. And Churchill, always thinking he's the smartest guy in the room, was, I think, stunned when he finally realized, uh-oh, Roosevelt is not going to get rolled for the British Empire. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, I, but even in his memoirs, Churchill may have realized it in 44, but he tries to make the best of a bad deal by, in his memoirs, painting the Americans as being wonderful and philanthropic and on our side, and we have this special relationship with them and everything is great, right. um, because he's trying to preserve what he can right, of the kind of general amity or at least working relationship that had existed in 42 and into 43 between the british empire and the united states mm -hmm. which goes away as the war goes on right so i think i think that's critical for understanding at least you know a, a lot of this tension that you see so it's hard to it's you know from from churchill wants to win his war mm -hmm. What's the means to win his war? Get the Americans in. We'll worry about the rest later. I'm smart. I'm a genius. I know how to work Americans. We'll, we'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. uh, the Admiralty is like, uh, no. We have to have a grand strategy. we got to stick to it. Mm -hmm. um, and that strategy has to be to the greatest extent possible based on our own resources. And this is one of the reasons why the Soviet alliance, despite the, the fact that I think I don't know, the Soviet Union brings to the table what Britain had historically always wanted from a continental ally, a big army. And then you get into the arguments of could Britain and the Soviet Union have defeated Germany and Italy by themselves, right? And you got some people who say yay and some people who say nay, but but the entrance of the Americans is a completely different thing because American power doesn't complement British power; it overwhelms British power, and I think that's that's something that the historians up to this point just don't really deal with very much. 
right? How well the Soviet alliance fit for Britain and the, the fact that from a, from a long-term grand strategy perspective, American assistance is essential. American entry into the war is completely problematic. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, just briefly, you asked about the financial piece, and um, I think this is kind of related. Um, I had mentioned that Churchill didn't want to give the bases in return for the ships. He just wanted to give the U.S. bases. And the reason for that was there were voices in Parliament who were saying, wait a minute, 99 year leases on all these bases? That's worth a lot more money than 50 old ships. And he knew it, everybody knew it, but he needed those ships. So he was, that's why he wanted to say, oh, let me just give you the bases. And Roosevelt's like, I can't do that. We gotta give them in return. So that's how they cut that deal that Britain gave Newfoundland and Bermuda, the bases there, in, uh, as just a gift, and the rest were in exchange for the ship. Jesse. Uh, yeah, so, uh, a, a little bit for everybody here, for, for, for John, for starters. Um, in thinking about New Zealand and New Zealand's kind of naval culture and the way that intersects with ideas of sort of Anglo-Saxonism and, and, and Nazi, I'm wondering where the Maori fit into this. Um, and maybe that's a question about Nazi himself, or maybe just in general. And at you know, this point, is a bit obscure, but I, I'm thinking of a, a letter to the editor I read once proposing <laughs> naming a ship HMS Maori and explicitly gesturing to the maritime heritage of Polynesian people as like a reason for yeah. doing this that was parallel to these sort of Anglo Saxonist arguments about. Um, Nabalism. So, you know, I, I'm wondering, you know, what Massey thought of of New Zealand's identity as a dominion and the way it's, you know, biracial society mapped onto this notion of, of Nabalism that, that he imagined. And, yep. then, and then, uh, sort of for James and Jennifer, I mean, both of you kind of touched on this, but I'm thinking about this question of sovereignty and Britain's ability to act as a great power without constraint. And I'm wondering if we too often, and I think both of your papers kind of spoke to this, think of this question only with respect to adversaries and, and not enough with allies, or, or, or who come to be allies, right? But that's a sort of re ahistorical assumption that we read back through the Second World War. And that if you treat the United States as a rival, you know, at what point really can Britain do something that the United States doesn't want it to do? Like, where do you actually put that line? And this goes back, this question goes back like far before my expertise. You know, after Hay Ponce vote in, in 1901, mm -hmm. right? Can Britain act in the Caribbean without American permission? Can it act with regards to Canada, like? John, back into the you know Victorian period, mm -hmm. there's a gun to Canada's head. What can yeah. Britain do in yeah. that theater? Yeah, and they and they realize it in the in the wake of the American Civil War. Right, obviously. Right, and and so if, if our question about sovereignty is you know can you act without another power's permission, you know, and we treat the United States as part of that equation, like sort of where do we really put the line uh, there? Come, from the the Maori. You know. The, the, the Maori have a, a, a unique position within settler colonialism. Um, you know, New Zealand's attitudes towards the Maori during the 19th and 20th century are fundamentally different than those, say, of Canada, Australia, and, and, and its indigenous populations. Um, no, yeah, certainly. Of course, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so there are, so for example, when when HMS New Zealand uh, 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 visits uh, uh, New Zealand in 1913 as part of a, a world sort of a PR cruise. Um, there's a there's a delegation of Maori chiefs that go on board and they make a they make a gift of a of a, a gift of the spray the, 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 the traditional uh, you know kind of war gear of, of, of Maori I forget the actual uh, piece of clothing but um, uh, the 
commanding officer wears, of, of New Zealand wears this in the, in the Battle of Jutland. And there is this kind of association, but it, it, it's almost kind of this, uh, to use a sort of uh, a more perhaps recent term, it's almost like a sort of appropriation of Maori culture in a, in a way that reads very much almost like a mascot type identity on HMS New Zealand. Um, but I don't see that Maori, uh, Massey is one of the most vocal critics of, of Asian and, and South Asian immigration in the Empire. He's, and in fact, this has become a, a big issue um, in New Zealand about two years ago that they, they discovered that Massey was racist and, and you know, somebody <laughs> found it. And, and so there is a, you know, Massey University, of course, is one of the larger universities in New Zealand. Yeah. And so there's a push to rename the university. And actually, it, it turns out most New Zealanders had no idea who Massey was. But, <laughs> um, um, but, uh, but anyway, um, but that being said, I, I, have, I, I actually had a graduate assistant it's been six months reading Massey speeches and, uh, you know, had to go to therapy afterwards, but, um, <laughs> but, but, but he, it's, it's his, his references to, to the Maori are very, very few and far between. I mean, he has opinions on pretty much everything. Um, yeah. And he, he actually, he belongs to this fringe movement called British Israelism, which is a, uh, that, that, uh, it, it's not city on a hill type mentality. It actually believes that, 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 Medieval Britons were the ancestors of one of the lost tribes of Israel, and then there was, yeah, yeah. so in other words, this idea of, of, of sort of this racial manifest destiny that is divinely ordained. I mean, this guy is not just a British race patriot; he is he is you know a, de a de devoted acolyte of this idea, and he says very very little about the Maori in, in ways that are actually quite peculiar. Yeah. One uh, one of our that too, that, that there have been a couple of ships probably. Right. This, this letter, I think, I think it was during the 09 naval crisis. And I want to say that they're calling for a, the next battle cruiser. And we funded, we're going to fund one, in other words, and call it New Zealand. Let's fund another and call it Asian Yeah. So, and, and John, the, the, the garment is a blue. Yes. Uh, yes. One, of our, one of our online commentators also threw that. Yes, in. thank so, you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that information. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Nathan. So I've, I've got a Comments I showed to Churchill and then actually answer to the sir question. Uh, when I was in the service as a, as a naval junior officer, we used to joke that ashore, the command master chief of the ship is arguably the second most and most important person on the ship, or maybe second only captain. Underway, he's 200 pounds of ballast. And you could argue from 1942 on, Winston Churchill was the command master chief of the Allied war effort. And basically, his, his military his allies really kind of had the job to get the war won. He was just kind of Give your speeches when you would just kind of stay out of the way and you know how to beat the Germans. No more soft runs to go to you. Uh, in terms of the destroyer issue, uh, even though they weren't covered by the Wash Naval Treaty, that covered just capital vessels. That was the right, only right, 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 to right. the British. Charles Evans Hughes wanted everything from tugboats to super dreadnoughts to be covered by that ratio. Uh, the London Naval uh, Treaty did cover those ancillary vessels, destroyers, and cruisers, and gave uh, a store level. They also had a 10 year review where they had to save money because not only was the Royal Navy asking for money, so was the British Army and Grand Second New World Air Force. So they had, yeah. as we mentioned, yeah. they went from the senior service to kind of begging for the scraps that they had to get. So that was why uh, they had limited number of destroyers. And then, the, uh, even though it was a self defeating tactic, the, the wolf tax, the concentrated the tactical defense view of tax, was something that they really, the old convoy system didn't really Right, right, right. So they did, so they're they're begging for destroyers from England makes makes total sense. And Corvettes too, that was the other undersigned uh, vessel in the Uh yes, sir. Um, I and have then, a, and then I have a question for Commander Tether. Um you mentioned that the leases that Britain gave the Americans were for ninety nine years. Yeah. Um you know the status of those now <laughs> and that when question. that deadline <laughs> comes for countries who have their sovereignty now, do you foresee that being an issue, having them being renegotiated? I know that even that area being under an American sphere of influence, I would think that negotiations would probably favor the Americans, but there's a country that wants to make a statement on the international stage and, you know, that's a little bit of a fight. Do you, do you foresee that happening? I don't know for sure, but I think the bases have all been given back. Um, the ones in Bermuda, I believe, were returned in the 1980s. Um, and um, 
in Bermuda, I've been, one of the interesting things that I found about the bases is uh, one of the bases that was built in Bermuda was started off as Kindley Airfield. And so they basically took 10% of the landmass of Bermuda, joined a bunch of islands, did a bunch of landfill, made a land airfield where there had not been one. Um, and it's now their international airport. But I don't know for <laughs> sure. Well, it has been their international airport for, for quite a while, but I don't know for sure. But I think they've given them all back. Everything's gone. Yeah, everything's gone. Thank you. Um, a question for Jennifer is given this issue of, you know, how, when are the British uh, a great power and when are they not suddenly? Uh, just wondering if there was anything in your sources about Churchill and his sort of insistence that these bases be gifts. Is is there any part of his thinking like, well, that's because we are the superior in this relationship, right? And we can afford to give you a gift. We don't necessarily need anything in return, although these destroyers would be great. But you know, sort of like noblesse oblige, you know, like we are on top as a, as a sort of means of, of stating Britain's power implicitly. Um, I didn't find that to. I didn't find that, but I mean, that may be, that may have been his thinking. I think he wanted them to be gifts because um, he knew that he didn't want it to be seen as an unequal transaction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? John, it looks like you're tentatively raising your hand. Yeah, well, I, I just a comment about the 50 I mean, they were pretty quick and useless. Uh, <laughs> and it took, it took more than weeks to get them Royal Navy standards. Um, and I guess from the standpoint of when they were employed in strength, I mean, you're dealing with 50, it's probably lucky if you've got 15 at sea at any one time. So, really, with regard to what they're doing. Another comment. Uh, Let's see, by May of 1941, we're now beginning to go in what I call the Second Quasi War, which the U.S. Navy now is basically at war with, with the Kriegsmarine. You've got the, you've got the um, Royal Marines are replaced by the U.S. Marine Corps in Iceland. You have, uh, and this is a, a few months after sinking of the Bismarck, you've got a battle division of New Mexico class battleships that are now patrolling the Denmark Straits. You've got uh, Americans building uh, airfields in Iceland. You've got that going on. We're also now uh, beginning to escort uh, convoys from the Western line, line yeah. westward. Mm -hmm. Of course, we've got the Greer's attack in July. Torpedoes uh, missed, but she responds. Of course, Reuben James goes down in the end of October. So we're really basically in a war, a naval war with Germany. And you think about how that is progressing, the ship then. It's already occurring in the battle for the Atlantic. Any other comments or questions? So even before that, we had uh, the Coast Guard kind of stunned the Bismarck and the battleships in New York and Texas when we went to the Yeah, I know. Yeah, you get the Coast Guard kind of scared the hell out when Bismarck said. They, they also saw um, <coughs> Prince of Wales in the Gulf of Mexico. Which ultimately, the people like Catalina that studied the Bismarck war right. had an American pilot who was technically trained, so he couldn't have dropped the bomb, but he was actually, we were, you know, getting, you know, half a step away from we that. Were there. We were there. It is 11 15. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 I think it's perfectly okay to stop a couple of minutes early. And before we do, I want to thank our panelists, Jennifer, John, and James, once again for the five papers, and to you, the audience, both for being audience and for the many of you who have asked questions ahead of time. Thank you.